So what that will lead up is actually a paradigm shift. We had a paradigm shift 100 years ago and the horse and wagon was replaced, the horse was replaced and they said this wagon is driving automatically. So you got the automobile. But this is not really true because the automobile is not driving itself. You as a driver are doing it. Now with all these cheaper uh, batteries, cheaper sensors, we are finally getting into the position of, of a fundamental thing that uh, not all information will go to the driver of the car or towards the car, like traffic information through the radio or visual signs from traffic signs you, you see. But all of a sudden the car is going to communicate with its environment, bi-directional. And that's maybe the most fundamental thing because 10 years ago they were demonstrating already that this is possible, but if you have all the same cars it can be done. But the real challenge we are facing is actually in this sentence that the challenge is to communicate as a car with other cars you have never communicated before with. So every second, if you are on the, thread, on the highway and you are communicating car to car communications, you have to communicate to cars you never had communicated before. And many of them will, have, will be of a previous generation. A generation thing actually, oh, and that's the yeah, answer. What I'm trying to say, I come back on the generation. Technologically, it's possible. If bandwidth is not monopolized anymore and sensors become real cheap, it's going to be affordable. And that's always critical in the automotive world. It has to be affordable as well. But it will be affordable to set up in the control system of a car a world model of what's happening around you with your sensors, with your car to car communication, and also communication to infrastructure. The thing is that only that way you can achieve that 100% of uh, instead of 99999 reliability. You need to have multiple world models to make decisions on. You still need to have the support for something like that, like road owners. Because you have to communicate, you need to have this communication to infrastructure for all time of previous generations of uh, cars. You have to have the support of car manufacturers, and here comes the problem. Why would Mercedes like to communicate this a BMW, uh, for example? It's really our challenge to make that a non-issue, that you really can do it in a multi-vendor environment and use open standards. And we have to need uh, the support of the car drivers. You're really taking away a little bit of their freedom. How can you do that in the sense that they really would uh, accept it and, uh, and, and really do it? The thing is that technologically we can do it already for 10 years. We still have this challenge because it is so complicated. It's not about just technology, it's about all the other things as well. Yes, we can do it, but we cannot do it alone. No one can do it alone. It's just too complicated for that. The thing is, however, that for example, from a point of view as, as, as my, my position as CTO of TNO, is that I do know that there are more smarter brains outside the company than we have in the company, and we are seeing in the Netherlands as well as the organization with a lot of smart brains. If they have this complex problem, how can I leverage on all the smart brains outside our company? If I also know that I can do it alone. What you then do is you create an, uh, a challenge, an open initiative, an open challenge. That means we are not this is the generation model. I wrote in an uh, English article, but uh, the publisher is here in the room as well, in Thinking Highways, a description on how to introduce this, really. It's an idea from Telecom to World, from GSM, UMTS, 2G, 3G, 4G, that something like that will be needed over the next few decades in automotive as, uh, automotive as well. First, you start informing um, uh, the, the car driver. Then you equip it with uh, ACC kind of uh, uh, technology, CCC, uh, connected uh, cruise control. You really start supporting the driver. Then you'll take over gradually with this cooperative driving on a single lane. You call it smart lane. For example, the third lane that only cars equipped with certain technology level, like the generation two or three, are allowed to drive on, uh, on a lane like that. Then you go for cooperative driving because more and more cars have implemented it. 
But they realize if you start introducing, introducing this, only 1% of the cars will have, and you still have to be able to communicate with these previous generation cars. How are you going to deal with it? It depends on an infrastructure who can really indicate that all the cars have an, uh, an older version of the cars. And then finally, later on, we'll have this automatic driving. What DARPA did, that was really an automatic driving. What we are trying to achieve is really this generation <coughs> three for the next years and generation four on cooperative driving. Some, some figures here in it. If we have on generation three only lane, no automatic steering yet, only uh, automatic uh, acceleration and braking, then you have uh, block uh, of platooning. In generation four, the thinking is a little bit, it, it's about changing lanes or in the suburbs, in the really swarm driving instead of between the right. But it is not the challenge about uh, automatic uh, driving. So it might be a little bit simpler than uh, the dark car challenge. The problem is, however, we have to set the standard between all of us, uh, what kind of communication standard we are using. Now coming back on, uh, what's our position in this one? <coughs> we do know that it'll take years. We're not heading for automatic driving, uh, autonomous driving. We are only for single lane initially, uh, cooperative driving. And probably in five years from now, and hopefully earlier, but it's always will think later, we'll have this swarm uh, driving. Um, but we said on this one, if we want to do this with others, and we want to participate in the challenge at a certain moment, we decide we are not going to participate as TNO in the challenge. We organize it. That's a simple statement. We'll, uh, we'll lead workshops, we organize workshops on the rules. What kind of rules will we use? What kind of sub subsets of standards will we use for the car-to-car -car communication? I mean, if they are all cars are driving in the same direction, it's a bit simpler communication protocol instead of a safety thing where two cars can uh, approach each other as a hundred kilometers an hour from both directions. Then you have to set up a communication far too fast. But if they are all driving in the same direction, it's much easier. So you can go for substandards initially. We'll provide infrastructure so that there is a world model broadcasted to the cars participating in it and we'll prepare these events with sponsors. Then we had a crisis in the automotive industry, so we decided not to go for a full event already next year, spring next year. Uh, we have the funding available for that event, but we'll restrict it a little bit and that we want to demonstrate that this cooperative driving enables public authorities to turn on and off a traffic jam, or at least to delay the starting of a traffic jam in the morning or in the evening uh, hours. And that's the ambition we now have. It's not going to be a challenge in which somebody can win. It's probably going to be the same type of hardware, and we are still discussing how we're really going to do it, but Nico will explain more about it. And in 2011, we think it's the right time that the teams have been able to prepare themselves, we have set up the, the rules, and we also have found sponsors willing to, uh, to pay uh, uh, all the costs we have because a challenge like this is far more costly than you initially uh, think. And that's, at this moment, uh, the, uh, the ambition we have.